uh, as we move forward. Hey, uh, today, uh, I just want to say welcome. It's so good to be with you. I'm Pastor Andrew here. Uh, But we're kicking off a brand new series, and it could scare you. It could scare you because it's an Easter series. Just take a moment and digest that that we are now into an Easter series already in this year. Uh, Next will be Christmas series, really. It's just going that quick. But uh, it is exciting because we're in an Easter series. We've only got a couple more weeks until Easter. And uh, as part of that Easter series, uh, we'll be looking at a whole heap of different things uh, that'll be happening over the life of Jesus. We're looking at his early life and establishing the who Jesus is uh, today in terms of his person, in terms of his identity Uh, The next week, we're looking at the authority of who Jesus is. Beyond that, we move towards Palm Sunday and then our Easter series as well. So, uh, sorry, the the passion uh, as we go into there. So, uh, if we uh, could, please make it a priority to come on board and come on the journey with this over these next five messages, over the next four weeks, as we look at the life of, uh, of Jesus. Before we get into that, this morning, I wanted to, to just share something that we've, we've actually been doing uh, from behind the scenes perspective. Many, what we've realized is that many people actually in our, in and amongst us here are using hearing aids uh, or some sort of hearing aiding devices uh, to help out. So we've actually installed uh, an FM transmitter into the building. So for those people who are struggling, who have hearing aids that can tune into uh, radio stations, I want to invite you to come on board of that journey with us. You can tune into 91.4 FM and you will hear a live broadcast. And that way you can turn the volumes up to wherever you need them to be if you're using a hearing aid device this morning or into the future, or you want to bring along something that can help you in that respect. We're just trying to make it so much more accessible uh, for us as a people group. But as I said uh, before, this morning we're actually looking at the identity of Jesus, the identity of Jesus. As a kid, there was a few things that I was told that kind of aren't really true. One of those things, right? Get this. Uh, when, when you screw up your face and everything, my mum would always say to me, change your face or mm, if the wind changes, your face will stay like that. Yep. Uh, anyone else got some of those type of, of things? Yeah, Mary, c- can you yell one out at me? Just that one? That one? Any, <laughs> were there any others? Any other people got fooled by this? Greg? Black spot on your tongue if you're lying. Enough to, if your ears grow, yeah, you can grow potatoes in your ears. <laughs> eat your carrots or you won't be able to see. Mine was, uh, was eat your crust so you won't get, and you'll get curly hair, right? It's funny because as you grow up with these type of things and everything, you start to realize, hang on a second, there's some evidence that might actually be contrary uh, to that as, as a reality. I don't know about the carrots one. I've never really investigated it. Maybe that's real. Um, any doctors want to confirm that? But uh, But there are certain things that we get told. And as you grow up and you look at the evidence of the things around us, you start to realize, hang on, maybe things aren't as they seem. Maybe things are actually different. Maybe the truth would tell us a better story if we were able to get the facts of the reality out in front of us and make an assessment of it. And so that's what my hope is this morning in relation to the identity of Jesus, that we can establish some facts. I can put the facts out in front of us this morning of the reality of who Jesus is, and then that will enable us as a congregation, as those joining us online as well, to be able to make an assessment to determine the reality of Jesus for each and every one of us. And it's an important question to us because if Jesus didn't exist and it's all made up, Christianity leads to death. Let me read that again. If Jesus didn't exist and it was all made up, Christianity leads to death. You can take that a hundred different ways because perhaps that would establish then that some other religion or some other practice would be the reality, the only way for us to get to know God that would lead us on a path to an eternal life. So if we believe in Jesus and he's fake and everything about Jesus is not real, 
then the only path is away from that reality. But if Jesus does exist, and he is who he says he is, then Christianity leads to life. In fact, if that reality is true, then it's the only religion, it's the only way to life. Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if he doesn't exist and he doesn't uh, live up to the claim of who he is, we're in a bit of trouble. In fact, we're in a lot of trouble because I wholeheartedly can stand here and declare that I do believe that Jesus is real, that he is the Lord of lords, the King of kings, that he is who he says he is, the Son of God, God himself, that he is the only way to salvation. That is the God that I believe in. It's a really important question for us to grapple with. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Because the scriptures even tell us a whole story about the reality of who he is. And this week in our internship program, we've actually been looking at the names of Jesus, the different realities and circles and spaces that Jesus was in. In the gospels alone, it describes Jesus as the son of man, the Lord, the rabbi, the Messiah, the son of man, the lamb of God, the logos, if you will. And in John chapter one, we get this description of Jesus himself as the word. I'm gonna read John chapter one. I haven't got this up on the screen, but if you do have your Bibles, flip open to John chapter one, and we're gonna read a whole host of verses here that will establish a platform for us to be able to move forward in this morning. It says this, John chapter one from verse one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world was made. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So the real question this morning, is Jesus who he says he is? Is Jesus who he says he is? Everything about our Christian faith hinges on the reality of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the reality ascribed to us through that initial chapter of John in chapter one there. And to answer that question, I want us to, to actually look at some evidence. I wanna look at what the Bible actually says, what scripture says, but I also wanna look at what history says to be able to put these things together to give us a platform to say, yes, we truly do believe that Jesus is who he says he is. So 
So let's start. What does the Bible say about Jesus? Well, in terms of the reality of him, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, it's all been captured in what we ascribe as the Gospels in the Bible. We know that he was born to Mary in a divine act, an immaculate conception, that Mary was a virgin at conception. We know that Mary and Joseph raised Jesus from, the, from birth. However, it wasn't on the 25th of December, as we would say, perhaps. Nor was it at the changeover from BC to AD, as we know it. No one knows the day that Jesus was born or exactly in what year. It's funny because in around 532 AD, uh, there was a guy, a monk, and his name was Denis Le Petit. He calculated that Jesus was born in the Roman year of 753, and that year was gradually adopted as, the, as 1 AD by the Christian countries. This is my favorite bit of this, right? <laughs> However, it is believed that Dennis miscalculated and Jesus was actually born between 6 and 4 BC. So we're off a little bit, but because that was already in place, we still exist under that time frame and in that framework. Matthew 2 tells us that Jesus was born in Bethlehem during a census period. That's why Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem. Had he and his family then escaped King Herod by fleeing down to Egypt? This is all found uh, in Matthew chapter 2. And that Jesus then landed himself in Nazareth. But we have minimal understanding afforded to us of the reality of Jesus' childhood through adolescence. In fact, heading towards Jesus' ministry period, we aren't afforded a lot of information. The things that we do know is that Jesus was a carpenter. His father, Joseph, was a carpenter. We find out in Matthew 13, verse 55, is not this the carpenter's son, it says. So we know that, that Joseph himself was a carpenter. And we know that Mary was his mother. Is not his mother called Mary? And we know that he had some family. And are not his brothers James and Joseph? And Simon and Judas, it says in Matthew chapter 13. And it is kind of assumed knowledge that Jesus himself learned how to take over the family business, to be a carpenter himself. Mark 6, 3 says, isn't this the carpenter referring directly to Jesus? So we, we know that Jesus had some, some construction-based skills and things and that he was able to build things. What we also know about Jesus is that he was able to observe Jewish traditions with his first teaching occurring at the Passover festival in Jerusalem when he was only 12 years old. It says this in Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 51. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up from the festival according to the custom after the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Imagine that. Any new parents in the room just, oh, I forgot my kid. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. And after three days, imagine like forgetting your kid for three days. They found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his poor parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Jesus' fault? Why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. We're three days away? Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. 
But his mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So whatever it was that Jesus was doing, he was learning more and more about God, but also how to relate to those people around him, those people of God, that he would gain their favor and wisdom, establishing himself as a man who taught with authority. Luke 3 tells us that Jesus began his public ministry at the age of 30 years old, that he was baptized and that a a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. So we start to establish the reality of who the scriptures actually say that Jesus is that God himself, a voice from heaven, declares that he is his son. And then we see throughout the rest of the gospel period there that Jesus establishes a discipleship group. He begins to teach people, not just about the things of the world, but the things of God, that they might become people of influence around them. And he establishes Simon, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Thaddeus, Bartholomew, Thomas, James, Matthew, Simon, and Judas Iscariot who was later replaced by Matthias as his disciples. He did a whole heap of miracles, turned water into wine. He did a whole heap of healings. There was casting out of demons. Even the evil spirits knew who Jesus was. He walked on water. He fed thousands upon thousands of people over and over. Twice. He raised people from the dead. He was a teacher. He taught as one with authority, Mark chapter one. And then as his ministry began, he actually went and taught people the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five through to seven, establishing the reality of the kingdom of God. And he shared, spoken in parables, about what it would be like to live in this reality of God's kingdom with an invitation for us, us as sinners, as broken people, to be a part of what Jesus had come to achieve and accomplish. We also know that Jesus was then tried, that Judas betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver, that he stood before the Sanhedrin who really didn't want anything to do with Jesus. But they decided they couldn't let this go on. He stood before Pilate, the emperor, who also didn't want anything to do with Jesus' trial, that he might be accused of killing the savior of the world as we know him now. The people declared Jesus guilty. And we know that Barabbas, a seasoned criminal who had done terrible things, was released in place of Jesus when the option was presented to the people. We also know from the scriptures that Jesus was crucified, that his body was disfigured beyond recognition in the lead up to that crucifixion, that he carried his cross, that he was crucified alongside two other criminals on Golgotha's hill. And that as he stood there, He forgave the sins of one of those criminals beside him and declared that he would be with him in paradise today. We also recognize that Jesus, as he hung on the cross and breathed his last, he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That in that moment, he was forsaken by God. That as he died, the temple veil was torn from top to bottom, releasing the power of God into the world. 
granting us direct access. No longer was there a priestly requirement to access God, but that Jesus had defeated sin and death. We also recognize that Jesus then was raised to life three days later. It's all captured in the scriptures, right? And then there's countless times when Jesus presents himself before the people. He appeared to Mary in John chapter 20. He appeared to Simon Peter in Luke 24. He also appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus as he walked with them and he broke bread and they finally recognized him. And in that moment, he was gone. He appeared to the disciples in the upper room without Thomas there. And then Thomas doubted, so he appeared again to Thomas and allowed him to touch his scars. It's captured in the scriptures. He also appeared to 500 other witnesses. So the scriptures are quite informative, if you will, about the reality of the life of Jesus. I want to encourage you as we run towards Easter, pick up one of the Gospels. If you're like me and don't enjoy reading lots, pick up Mark. Pick up a Gospel, read it. Discover the facts for yourself that crusts don't make your hair curly. So what other evidence? Let's have a look at history. Because history surely could tell us something about the reality of Jesus. The one thing that history won't tell us is that Jesus was the Son of God. But history can tell us that Jesus existed. It can tell us about his life. It can tell us about his death. It can tell us about the humanness of who Jesus truly was. Tacitus, you might have heard that name. He was a, a Roman historian and he wrote the Annals in uh, 116 AD. And it says this, because this is, this is something that really captures the reality. Consequently, to get rid of the report, this is about Nero now, right? Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite torture on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom, he na whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our prosecutors. Pontius Pilate and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. See, Tacitus records this identity of Jesus Christ, of whom the name had its origin of Christianity, who suffered the most extreme and excruciating penalty at the hands of one of their prosecutors. This is history. Josephus is another historian, Roman historian this time, Roman Jewish historian. He wrote the Antiquities of the Jews and the Testimonium Flavium. And in those documents, it says this, in the Antiquities of the Jews, book 20, chapter 9, Josephus refers to the stoning of James, the brother of Jesus, James the Just, by order of Ananus. Bananus, a Herodian era high priest. You see, there's a record of 
Jesus. The testimony of Flavinum, meaning the testimony of Josephus, is a passage found in book 18, chapter 3 of the Antiquities, in which Josephus describes the condemnation and crucifixion of Jesus at the hands of the Roman authorities. The testimonium is likely the most discussed passage in Josephus. These history books talk about the reality of Jesus, that he was a real human, but that he died a horrendous death, a crucifixion. Pliny, he was a Roman governor in Turkey at the time, and he authored the epistolate. He says this, Pliny details the practices of Christians. He says that they meet on a certain day before light when they gather and sing hymns to Christ as to a God. They all bind themselves by oath, not to some crimes, as Pliny says, as though that is what he would have expected. Rather, they pledge not to commit any crime, such as fraud, theft, adultery, or subsequently share a meal of ordinary or innocent food. All these things that the Bible and scriptures teach us of, to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to our great God, captured here in history. Herodotus wrote about Christ. Oh, I can't even pronounce this one. Thycodides is what I'm going with wrote about Christ. Tacitus wrote about Christ. Caesar's wrote about Christ in Gallic War. Livy's Roman history captures things. The New Testament as a history book captures the reality of Jesus as Christ. It's interesting because we would much prefer to take some of these writings as fact in our history than we do the Scriptures. Tacitus writing it alone has 20 copies. And we etch Tacitus in history as one of the greatest philosophers. The New Testament alone, 5,000 plus Greek original copies, 10,000 Latin copies, 9,300 other records, 20-something thousand plus original manuscripts, and we ask questions. You see, historically, the evidence stacks up to the reality of the personhood of Christ. There is no doubt, no doubt, that Jesus Christ existed as a human. Question is, is Jesus who he says he is. Does the historical evidence stack up to say that Jesus is the son of man? Like what the scriptures declare, like what the history books would give to us. Does the biblical evidence stack up to say that he is the son of God? That in him is the only way to salvation. As we read things like Matthew 3, 16 and 17, this declaration that he is the beloved son of God. In verse 17 at the bottom of the screen, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. This identifies Jesus to us. In Mark chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, is the introduction that we are given by Mark. C.S. Lewis says this, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be insane or else He would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is 
the Son of God, or else insane, or something else. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. The evidence stacks up. And if we declare even today that he is who he says he is, then we should do what he says for us to do. That we should not merely be listeners of his word, but that we should be doers of his word. There is no opportunity for us to be lukewarm on this. We have to be all in when it comes to the reality of Jesus Christ. And if we are all in, then we must do what it is that he calls us to do. To therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the ends of the age. This is the identity of Jesus. This is the reality of Jesus. The evidence is clear that Jesus is the real deal. The question is, do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is? And what will you do with it? All hail King Jesus. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you so much, so much for the reality of Jesus Christ on this earth. Lord, we thank you that you sent your son down to this earth that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Lord, we thank you that the historical evidence stacks up, that the biblical evidence stacks up and declares that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is who he says he is. God incarnate. Lord, we thank you that as Jesus lived out a life that honored you, he chose to be obedient to the will of the Father a will that would send him to the cross, that would send him to his death. But Lord, a will that would bring salvation for the entirety of the universe. Father, that we might be reconciled to you through our faith in Jesus Christ, who died and rose again, defeating sin and death, so that we might have life, life eternal, and life in relationship with you. Father God, we declare your goodness in this place this morning. We declare the wonderful name of Jesus. We declare the beautiful name of Jesus. We declare the powerful name of Jesus in this place. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. We pray this in his precious and holy name. Amen. Would you stand as we worship?